Okay, hello, my name is Paolo Blickstein. I'm an assistant professor at Stanford, and my co-author is Arnand Sipitakiat, who is a professor at Chiang Mai University in Thailand. And we've been working for 12 years in open hardware for education for children and students, and we're going to share some of the experiences that we had uh, over this last decade. So I want to start talking about this curve. As you know, this is the normal distribution. And if you think about technical ability or familiarity with technology as normally dis distributed, which is a reasonable assumption, we here are in this you know, little uh, three standard deviations above the, the mean uh, group. So, and this is just like, you know, 0.5% of the population. Maybe you are even like further down. But when we design stuff for ourselves, for our community, for the open hardware community, we don't really have to care much about the rest because we are designing for our colleagues, our friends, and people who we design for, they kind of can figure things out, they're hackers and all of that. But when we talk about education, uh, it's quite different because it's not even about you know, designing for people who know a little bit more, uh, it's designing for the other 99%. Because you know, kids in schools, uh, you know, of course, there'll always be the the one percent, you know, super technical able kids who will hack an Arduino and all of that. But the truth is that 99 percent of those kids, they they don't, they are not those uh, uh, super, you know, hacker kids. And if you don't design for them, you're just making the gap between those, you know, elite kids and the other ones uh, widen. So that's a very important mission that we have. And the second thing about this curve is that, uh, you know, income distribution is also a kind of nonlinear uh, curve, and it's not normal like this, but it works in the same way. You know, if we design only for the top 10% of uh, income, and this translates to schools that, you know, have more or less money to buy hardware, we are also limiting a lot the reach of the devices that we, that we design. So, uh, you know, this man here, Seymour Papert, what he did in the 80s was to say, okay, let's popularize computing for kids, uh, programming. And he invented a programming language that was designed from scratch for kids. And he succeeded. And millions of kids in the 80s and 90s were programming in Logo. And a lot of people said, no, you know, Logo, it's not a, uh, like a, a grown-up language. You should teach, you know, Pascal or Basic or whatever. But you know, Seymour succeeded, and his group, after doing Logo, started doing physical computing devices. So they started doing children's robotics. You know, they did the, 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 red, the MIT Red Brick, which was the prototype that generated the Lego uh, robotics, then the MIT Cricket, and then, you know, another uh, uh, one was the Google Board, which was derived from the MIT Cricket. So there was a huge amount of design and thinking that went into designing, creating those devices, and they were specifically designed for kids. And, and we'll talk about the design principles that, uh, that led to, those, uh, to the success of those devices in schools. They were easy to use, um, kids had an easy time putting things together and all of that. So those are hugely successful uh, devices. However, at the same time, uh, you know, at the, the end of this process, towards the 2000s, uh, there was another big uh, thing happening, which was hacker robotics. So the basic stamp came out in 92, and then, you know, the wiring uh, platform came out in 2004, and then other, you know, derivatives of wiring uh, that we, we, like Arduino and, and PC, all, all the other ones that we saw, we, we know today. And they were designed for a completely different audience. They were not designed for kids. They were designed for hackers, for you know, uh, college students doing interactive art projects or electronics projects and all of that. And, 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 because, and what happened with those platforms is that they took over the world. So you know, Arduino took over the world, and it became a de facto standard everywhere. The problem is that those two types of devices were designed for different audiences. So, uh, you know, the Legos and the, the Crickets, they were designed for kids. So if you look at the design documents from the Lego company that are uh, public, some of them, they put a lot of thought into designing the connectors in a way that they would be apolar, so you could connect them in any way, and it could be really easy for kids to put them together, even without any knowledge of electronics. And, and their Arduino wiring design, you know, they were designed for a different audience. I mean, it's not that they were 
in, interested in you know uh, ten year olds. They were interested in, in another kind of audience. The problem is then when you try to use one thing that was designed for hackers with kids, and and that's what I want to you know that's what my my talk is about. So uh, what we did you know in the 90s with Lego was to make all of those devices really easy to use. And what, what Arduino and wiring and all of that did was to make a lot of those devices cheap and low cost. So now the big opportunity for the open hardware community is to go to this quadrant here, reducing cost and making things easy to use. Because for education, uh, uh, the how, much, how easy things are to use is just another part of the cost. Because it's an illusion to think that if your board costs $15, but it's really hard to use, uh, it's, it's cheap. It's not cheap because schools, they need to hire people to teach the kids to, to use those devices. And the harder your device is to use and figure out, the more people uh, you need in the school to teach the kids. So it's just another form of adding cost to, to the use of, of your device, making it hard to use. So, this is a big space that we have to, and, and I'm going to talk today about a couple of design principles that we can use uh, to design things that are easy to use. So the design principle number one is what I call selective exposure. So this is about what is foregrounded and backgrounded in, in your hardware design or software design. So let me give you some examples. So those are eight things that you can hide or, or show or expose to students. You know, polarity, the microcontroller pins, resistors, Ohm's law, and, and all, all those kinds of things. So let's see one example of this. So if you're building something like this with an Arduino and a breadboard and all of that, all of those eight things are exposed to the user. The polarity, the microcontroller pins, you need to know about resistors, you need to know about Ohm's law to find the right resistor, you need to know how the breadboard works, the electrical connections, the inputs and outputs, and everything, and the programming. But I guess you can imagine that for you know, a 10-year-old, this is pretty overwhelming to learn all those eight things at the same time. So what happens when kids use uh, uh, these kinds of platforms is that some kids succeed because they are you know, technically more able, but a lot of kids fail, or they just do things without really understanding what they're doing. So let's look at what some designers did to solve this problem. So you know, uh, you know, Leah Bickley is a brilliant designer and part of this community too. She decided to background three of those eight things, the resistors, the Ohm's law, and, and the functionality of the breadboard. So there's no breadboard, uh, there are no resistors, they're built in into the hardware. And then, as a result, she got a lot more people to use those kinds of uh, devices. So that's one, one platform. A second platform is the Pico Cricket, which was designed here at MIT by Mitch Resnick and his team. So here, again, if you look at what they did, they backgrounded polarity, so there's no polarity. You don't care about microcontroller pins, about resistors, about anything. All, all, the, all you care about is inputs and outputs and programming. So by background, all of this other stuff, kids can have a an experience of success with robotics in five or 10 minutes. And of course, later you can introduce them to these other things. But I'm just giving you examples of how you can background a lot of the things that are not your learning priority, they are not your priority in terms of learning goals. And then after kids are familiar with those things, then you can expose them to those things. Second design principle is self-error correction. So, how does the material communicate the rules of usage to the user without a manual, without you know, instruction? So Lego is perfect for that because you, two Lego bricks, you know exactly what you do. You have to put them together in this way. You never try to put them like upside down or all of that because the material is communicating to you how to use it. So in terms of hardware and you know, this kind of robotics, physical computing platforms, those are some examples of you know, how to connect, what can be connected to what, safety protection so that you don't blow up things, categories of parts, what's input, what's output, <coughs> and indication of functionality. So what, what, is, what are the parts? So again, some examples. So here, <clears throat> again, you have no, no indication of uh, how to connect things, what connects to what, what are the categories of things. You have to figure things out completely by yourself. Uh, in this other example, so you might know the Kubelets platform, a lot of this is designed into the material. So what to connect, 
how to connect things to, so the magnets, they connect by itself, so by themselves, so you know what connects to what. The inputs are black, the output, the logical parts are red, and the, the outputs are transparent, so you know exactly you know, which are the parts. There are categories that are built into the design. This is another example, little bits, that you know, it's being demoed here. Again, you have, uh, you know what connects to what. They are color-coded, so, you know, it's easy to know what's an input, what's an output. They don't connect in the wrong way. Uh, you can't mess up the polarity and all of that. So the materials in those cases are, you know, communicating to the users what you do. This is another example from my lab. Uh, it's called Light Up. It's also being demoed here, where, uh, again, you know, a lot of those things are communicated just by the design, how to connect things, safety protection, so you can't blow up things. Um, the, the parts are color-coded and all of that. And we, we took a, a, a slightly different take here. We allow kids to connect things in the wrong way because we wanted them to make mistakes sometimes. But we built an app that, you know, you take a picture of your circuit and it has visual tags and it has a P-Spice uh, circuit simulator in the app. So you can, the app can tell you what, what is connected wrong. So you, didn't, you don't need to call the teacher and say, hey, come here, what's wrong with my circuit? The app tells you what's wrong. So that's another way of making your design more accessible as well. So with those two design principles, selective exposure and self-error correction, I wanted to give you some ideas about, you know, in your next project that you're gonna do for education uh, for kids, two things that you can think about. First, how are you gonna pick and choose the, the kinds of aspects of design and computation and electronics that you're gonna to expose to your users first. Because if you expose everything, all the complexity, it just, it's gonna scare kids away, and, and that really happens. And the second is how you're gonna design your, your board, your, your material, to communicate to the user automatically what, what can be done, what connects to what, and, and make the user uh, understand how, how the material can be used without instructions. And those things, they help uh, not only your you know, device uh, to be uh, more popular and all of that, but as I said before, you know, we have to think about the, the whole spectrum of this normal distribution. Because just too much of what we do is focused on the more technically able people. But when you think about design for education, we have to think differently. We have to think that complexity in our products translates to higher cost of ownership for schools. So we're effectively making it a lot harder and a lot more expensive uh, for schools to adopt and for kids to use. And what ends up happening is that uh, the gap between people who can use those materials and people who cannot use those materials just grows and it generates exactly the opposite of what we want. So, uh, I think there is a great opportunity here, you know, be in this new quadrant of low cost and easy, easy to and ease of use. And you know, I'd love to talk more about this. And if you have ideas, and if you want to uh, collaborate on projects and and make versions of your products that are easy for kids to use and all of that, I'd love to to collaborate on that. And I think that's a big opportunity that we have to make the open source. Uh, harder community relevant and to really impact education in a major way. So this is, you know, where you come in. So thank you.